Hello, ma'am, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Yes, ma'am, we are live streaming right now, so uh, it's ready. Uh, you all can begin. Please be alert on your WhatsApp. Yes, ma'am. Hi everyone, to all those tuning in into this special edition of Let's Talk Policy. I'm Smita Sharma, I'm an independent journalist and a visiting faculty at the Kautilya School of Public Policy in Hyderabad. And this is our monthly ongoing series where we take a deep dive, in fact, perspective, insights from experts, from academicians, from theorists and practitioners of certain topics. And uh, it's, a, it's a very, in fact, uh, important panel that we have today you know, it's a very interesting panel. Before I talk about the panelists themselves, um, you know, I, I, by the way, I'm in Uzbekistan in the ancient city of Samarkand at the moment covering the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and all the world leaders, regional leaders out here. So you may just hear some siren noises once in a while. Don't get freaked out. But, uh, you know, when you talk of leaders and leadership, elections is, of course, the path to be getting there where you want to be in terms of being able to govern, in terms of being able to lead. But elections have just undergone so much of transformation across the world. When you talk about the United States, the world's oldest democracy, starting from the late 60s to the 70s, that's when major transformations actually happened in the United States of America. In India, if you look at, a whopping 55,000 to 60,000 crore rupees was spent in the general elections of 2019, this is as per a report by the Center for Media Studies. It is a not-for-profit think tank. And the study report titled Poll Expenditure, the 2019 elections termed the last polls in India as the most expensive election ever anywhere. So this report estimated a near six-fold jump, a six times jump in the overall expenditures from 9,000 crore rupees that was sent in, spent in the Lok Sabha elections way back in 1998 to around 55,000 crore rupees in 2019. That's massive. And when you have this kind of money involved, when you have the kind of modern technology that is being used today by world leaders, by global leaders, and also the many multiple challenges that come along with it, it becomes very important to understand the role of political campaigns, of political consultants, of how are campaigns actually shaping up these larger electoral battles? What kind of tools are they providing to those interested to be in a public career? Mine Philibe in 2000, of course, defined the term campaign as development of organizations and processes that mediate between citizens and those who would represent them in government. And in India, where we are perpetually in an election mode, we call elections to be our national festival, really. It's the next big elections, 2024. The preparations are already on. Congress says Rahul Gandhi is doing a Bharat Jodo Yatra. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the BJP, of course, never exhausted when it comes to being in an election campaign mode. So to talk about political campaigns, their roles today, I'm joined by a very interesting panel, as I promised, Professor Steve Jarding. He's been an educator, a commentator with more than four decades of experience. He's actually advised several of his students have also gone on to become leaders in the public sphere, including presidents, prime ministers, members of parliament, members of Congress, governors, mayors as well. Um, he is an author. He works on political campaign strategy. He has served as the faculty of Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government until June, in fact, 2019. And for 16 years, really, the course that he was teaching there, making of a politician and a political campaign management, it, he became one of the most influential educators because of the course. And we are lucky here at the Cotillia School of Public Policy because he is a visiting faculty there and is in Hyderabad currently as we speak in the studio. Thank you so much, Professor Jarring, for joining us here. Well, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. I look forward to this evening. Thank you. I also have with me Vasudha Singh. She is a director, founder for VoteBridge India that is looking at the intersectionality of how political campaigns and policies can really be framed. She has formerly been with IPAC, which kind of caught the nation's imagination. Prashant Kishore's, uh, you know, led by Prashant Kishore, that uh, that really brought, in a way, political campaigning to India in a more structured format. Before that, she was with Ernst and Young. Uh, she was also a state lead for IPAC in assembly elections in Delhi, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, she's worked with the governments in Bengal, in Uttar Pradesh as well and has experience in consulting in both the government as well as the political domain. Thank you so much, Vasudha, for finding time for this. 
Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. And last but not the least is a practitioner, somebody who has actually seen a political campaign firsthand. He was uh, my former colleague in IBN7, has had a long distinguished career in journalism. Ashutosh, who also fought the Delhi Assembly elections on an Aam Admi Party ticket. And uh, currently, he is the co-founder for a very popular Hindi news portal called Satya Hindi. Um, he is one of India's sharpest political analysts, has also penned several books, uh, especially on the rise of RSS, on the way the BJP works, and a lot of other topics as well. Thank you so much, Ashutosh, for joining Thank us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Jaring, if I may become, you know, if I may start with you, because when it comes to American politics today, I think one of the most sort of disputed, talked about, and contemporary topics is the contemporary political campaign in America. As to what purpose is it serving? Is it really about trying to bring individuals who have merit and talent, give them the necessary tools, uh, hone up their capabilities and bring them into public service? Or is it essentially led to a practice where candidates with the best possible money power, you know, in India's case, muscle power, the caste factors, and somebody who knows how to use, abuse, and misuse modern technology can have an advantage. What is political campaigning in the U.S. today all about, Professor John? Well, it's it still is probably a little bit about both, but it's clearly moving in the wrong direction. It's moving more toward personality-driven politics, certainly money-dominated politics, uh, use of disinformation, uh, really a a, a horrible, I think, uh, uh, direction for representative democracy for the United States. Uh, a lot of countries of the world look to the U.S. and see what we do. We have a, a former president uh, that that told uh, America and the world that our elections are rigged. They are not. Uh, that's a lie. Uh, and yet three-fourths of the of registered Republicans in America believe it was because President Trump said so. Those are all very disturbing signs. And you mentioned record amounts of money in India. Uh, it, the, the record amounts in America, they just keep falling. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And after the Supreme Court uh, in 2010 in the United States uh, 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 handed down a decision that essentially said uh, that you did not any longer have to disclose donors and you could have this kind of under the table money. And by the way, including a non-American money for the first time in US history, I think it opened the door to tor uh, terrible corruption. We have billionaires that are literally trying to buy US Senate seats uh, in states that they don't live in. It's just, a, it's a bad trend. And it, America still does a lot of things that work, but we have to figure out this money angle and we have to figure out disinformation because both entities are to me at least a cancer on representative democracy and we have to get our arms around. It. Right, you know, and a lot of that I think will find resonance also with all those who have tuned into this conversation, students as well as, uh, you know, those outside of the campus. And we will take their questions as well in a short while from now. But Ashutosh, let me come to you and ask you, you know, while Professor Jading was talking about the loads of money that is being used Electoral bonds, another controversial issue in India. But what was your personal experience of fighting that election? You know, for somebody like you who came from the background of journalism, who I would like to believe, and I've known you for very long, doesn't really have millions of rupees lying around in his bank accounts, possibly. Uh, was it a jarring affair? You know, what were your worries like, your challenges like as a candidate coming from a much simpler background who took on and took a plunge into the Lok Sabha elections? Uh, uh Swita, while while reading politics and uh, while while covering politics and uh, contesting election, these are three different things altogether. Uh, politics, I think, is is in, in my in my experience, is probably the dirtiest game ever. What you think and what you read and what you understand when you really enter into the electoral politics, then you realize that how deep uh, the rot is in. And uh, a man like me, uh, who almost had uh, no money, and then I was uh, I was contesting elections. It was it was it was very very difficult uh, difficult for me, uh, because my opponents uh, and two of them, one uh, went on to become uh, the cabinet minister, other was a cabinet minister when he was contesting elections. So obviously I had I had no money to fight with them. See in India the, after 2014 elections, uh, there is a there is a total change. There, there's a paradigm shift has taken place. Uh, earlier, the election used to be fought uh, maybe when the elections were just uh, a month away or something like that. Now, the campaigning is is continuous process. It's not that 
uh, 15 days uh, before the before the voting or the campaigning begins. It's something very different now, uh, especially with the way uh, Mr. Modi and the, uh, the BJP uh, has formed the government at the center and the kind of uh, change they have brought in. It's a it's a combination of like like a huge capital. It's a, com a huge capital. Then the party structure, then the ideology and also uh, uh, something like a state apparatus. All four together, they become such a gigantic machine that it's very difficult and almost impossible for the opposition party to match up to that uh, to that level. Uh, uh, you, they not this this machine not only have I think uh, uh, this is the richest political party in the world, and maybe no party can imagine to compete with them. Uh, the kind of money they have, but other than that, they also believe in squeezing the financial uh, sources of the of the of the opponents. That's Ashutosh, another... I, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to know, did, did you have a political campaigner? I mean, your party did have hmm. the Ahmadmi party at that point in time. I know you're no longer associated with them. Hmm. But did you have a political consultant uh, that you were seeking advice from or you no. couldn't afford that? No, no, no. We, we, in fact, as a party, we didn't have any any political consultant. And uh, in fact, it was a, it was 2014 that uh, you we, we heard the name of IPAC and the Prashant Kishore. And then Prashant Kisor became a buzzword uh, in almost every election. He moved from BJP to the Janta Dal United and then to other political parties. But the Ahmadi party at that point of time was 40, was fighting elections uh, and taking the moral high ground that we'll spend only the, this amount of money. And I still remember they, they, they had gone public with the, the crowdfunding. And then they, they said that we need 20 crores to fight elections. And when the, the uh, through the uh, crowdfunding, they could get 20 crores. They said, no, we don't want, we don't need extra money after that. So please don't give us money. See, that that the kind of politics the Ahmadi party was pursuing then. But since mm -hmm. then, the lot of water has flown and now the party is completely changed. So it's also the pressure which is coming uh, to the all the political parties since 2014. And 2014 will go down in Indian history as a turning point and not only in the campaigning, but also in kind in the construction of a new India altogether. So the entire right. paradigm has changed, entire the entire the idioms have changed, entire the phrenology has changed, and the mode of campaigning has also gone under tremendous change. Absolutely. And Basuda, you were the person behind the screen who was working on campaigns then. Tell us, you know, because you had prior, of course, uh, uh, experience in terms of working with governments on specific issues or policies. But when it comes to the campaign process, what was your experience like in India? You know, you had studied in LSE political science. And when you took the dive of political campaigns in India, what was a surprise factor for you? Something that you hadn't imagined that that would be like that tough? Uh, right, absolutely. Um, um, I do understand the uh, problem of money uh, that political candidates face, building on from the last uh, point that Mr. Ash Ashutosh made. We have in, in political consultancy on our uh, on ground experience, we have also seen a party win, which has spent one rupee uh, as compared to 10 rupees spent by the opposition, but they have still come, managed to come to power. And we have also seen uh, one constituency in Southern India go for a hundred crores spent by each of the candidates who were fighting and four of them were fighting. So it's uh, really been uh, uh, like, a, because it's India, it's really been an eye opener in terms of the kind of diversity that exists even in terms of how people are fighting elections, right? So that's the number one. And the number two, what my experience still now has been that political <laughs> consultants actually, so, so we are able to take care of the votes, right? We are able to help in concerting the efforts and we're able to work on the margins and help someone build something. Uh, but the note is still a question. And uh, that is what I feel that uh, now with the uh, incoming of various types of political consultancies in India, like it's not just one type of consultancy. There is There are now people actively working on ground for helping uh, uh, people raise funds for uh, candidates with... Um, uh, who need that kind of help as well. I just feel that we are moving in the correct direction in time ter terms of democratizing electioneering as well. So um, uh, Mr. Ashutosh is absolutely right when he when he was fighting elections like post that IPAC and the boom happened, right? So now I think we are a little better placed. And I also feel with the kind of 
concerted efforts that uh, uh, the synergy that is created, it is possible now for a candidate to fight another candidate who may have a lot of money. So I, okay. I feel, uh, yeah, I feel that has been the shift since 2014. <laughs> And that's very interesting uh, because I do know in Amadmi Party, somebody like an Atishi Marlene, of course, you know, she went through crowdsourcing roots herself right. and we had friends Absolutely. who were, uh, you know, working on that. But uh, Professor Jading, Vasuda here says that it looks like there is a right course and right approach when it comes to political campaigns that's in India, unlike your perception of what has happened to the political campaigning shift in the United States. And when you look at the way television, radio, news functions today, uh, it looks like they really don't add much in terms of people's understanding of the political issues of the day, the governing abilities of the candidate. So how do you go about making sure as a political campaigner that your candidate's abilities is the one that is put out there? And do you really pick your clients going by, because it's not just the clients who are picking up the campaigners, you are also interviewing them. Um, are you already working on at least some winnability factors that do exist before you accept an individual for your campaign? Well, I mean, I, I do think that, that, it, it does matter to the question of uh, when you look at working in a campaign or working for an individual or a party, uh, there, there's a core kind of foundation that I think we all have. We, we, we tend to fall back on our values, uh, our belief system as to which party uh, might uh, move the envelope in a direction that we want to move. But the dilemma becomes this politicking. Um, I tell uh, students and candidates a lot that that parties and party identification in many ways is merely a vehicle to get title. I'm not belittling the, the foundation of a party or the ideological uh, spectrum of a party, but if you don't have title, you can't cannot govern. And the dilemma today, and I think India is going to face this, I, I think it is, it's a double-edged sword. I think it's terrific that India is getting modernized campaign uh, practices and modernized consulting practices, but with that comes a literal price tag, that elections become extremely expensive uh, if you want to compete. I think it would be honorable if we didn't need them, but I think we'd be fooling ourselves. Uh, I, normally, ruling parties have an advantage. Uh, obviously, they have a megaphone. They, they can get in the mainstream and social media news every day, probably easier uh, in most cases than uh, minority uh, campaigns and candidates. Uh, but they also tend to to attract the money. And unless a system has uh, some sort of a, a, a buffer that says we're going to control uh, campaign finance in some fashion, and it's difficult to do, um, you, you run the risk that as India becomes more modernized in its uh, campaign consultancy, that the price tag will freeze out a lot of the more minority parties or a lot of the, the smaller parties at the expense of those with the cash. That's my fear for India. Is, is I've, I've done consulting here in the past and I've worked campaigns, may well do it again, um, obviously here at, at Cotillia Teaching, uh, but I've talked to a lot of people and everybody you talk to, doesn't matter the party, if they're an out party, uh, money is a concern and it should be a concern. Um, but there is a danger. And as, as India grows into its consultancy, I think the India needs to be very careful for how it looks at money and politics, how it tries to level the playing field. If they don't, I fear that the playing field will get very uneven very quickly. Uh, Ashutosh, your thoughts? I mean, is it really increasing the kind of gap between the haves and the have-nots when it comes to public life? And in India in particular, when you look at there is a different India, a different Bharat, the rural bell candidate is very, very different. The marginalized communities, they're very different. Are we running those risks here with the campaigns? See, I think uh, in terms of uh, making a division between the rural and urban, I think it's better if we if we divide uh, uh, between, the, between the political parties because the political parties, uh, 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 I think uh, they have understood the game. And that's why uh, almost in every constituency, my experience is experience say that for a contesting uh, assembly elections, you at least need 10 crores. Uh, but for the parliamentary election, nothing less than 40 crores. So uh, for a poor wow. candidate to contesting election and spending that kind of money is almost next to impossible. 
so unless you get some black money or you get money from some some other sources only then you can imagine a contesting election and giving tough fight to to any other other, other contestant so uh, i think in that sense uh, what the bjp has brought in the bjp has brought in two things one is they are they are they are the one political party in this country which uh, which were very close to the technology they adopted technology before anybody could could do that and they also started spending lot of money because at that point of time they they thought that the congress system is so big system and to fight congress system you need all kinds of uh, infrastructure in terms of money in terms of technology in terms of everything else and they have a very strong uh, strong uh, political apparatus what mr uh, modi has contributed as a party is uh, at the helm of affair of the political party is that he had combined all four that uh, like ideology the party structure the money and uh, and, and 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 the these these things together and then it has uh, made very difficult for the party like congress party which is which has been which is a history of contesting elections today uh, the the congress coffers is almost uh, almost nil because hmm. they they are facing uh, some somebody is facing income taxes somebody is facing enforcement directorate somebody is facing some other central agencies and uh, uh, you 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 can see right bit uh, right right during the campaigning you will find some innocuous person is being raided by by so and so uh, central agencies but if you go deep into then you will realize that this particular person was fi- was financing for a particular candidate or a particular a particular political parties so you squeeze the ca- you squeeze the financial power of of, of that candidate and then hmm. it becomes very unequal fight so today hmm. uh, unless uh the opposition political parties other political parties are fighting with the bjp uh they could create waves they could create a kind of a strong anti incumbency against the against, against the ruling party it becomes very difficult to match in terms of resources in terms of technology in terms of money in terms of everything and don't forget right bjp is one political party which is blessed with two extra things which the other political parties do not have one is the ideology so they 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 have sold a utopia they have sold a future plan for the for the for the countrymen and that's also a great attraction then they have a a political structure which is multi layered like congress can can boast of one structure like congress uh, but here the bjp has got an rss the vishindu parishad the bajrang dal the kisan sabha the mazdoor sabha and everybody works together so it becomes such okay. a gigantic thing you know and hmm. that's that's a cult because earlier they used to fight together but mr modi had synchronized all together towards one goal to win election come what may basuda is this your feeling as a political campaigner that it is becoming a david versus goliath kind of a fight and as a campaigner do you really you know can you ensure that you are also democratizing the electoral battle by influencing voter behavior by ensuring that more people come out to vote by more people understanding that who they are voting for uh right so uh let's talk about uh rest of india where say for example a centralized narrative is tougher to reach right uh we enter a constituency and we live there for one year two years depending on the kind of project that we have but the uh am janta the general public that is living in the constituency the voters have been living there for like 30 40 60 years right so when we come in or with a, or any political narrative that comes in the voter is very aware of their candidates right uh second point is that uh, you know like uh, to win to win uh, a seat you need support of various kinds of communities that make up your voter base you cannot rely on any single particular community uh, on an average you need say about 60000 votes to uh, emerge as a winner 40 to uh, 50 keeps shifting um so you a particular narrative about a particular community or a particular segment will never work for a candidate right so i think those are the spaces in which we enter uh, we are able to communicate to the voter of the constituency very clearly uh we are able to i mean that happens when we're able to clearly inform the voter about the incoming government's agenda that we're trying to set right uh, uh i i see definitely a shift uh since the first year that i started working in this space to the sixth year that i'm in it now that more and more uh, people are relying on giving their vote to what is the crisp one pager seven pointer promise 
that the incoming uh, candidate is trying to make or the incoming hmm. government in the state is trying to make so i just feel i mean the long drawn out manifestos now have become redundant right and what come what is in fact is like nitish ke sath nishchay or uh, jmr's navratna alu or didi zongi ka there are so many examples or mr arvind kejriwal's guarantees etc so i feel that in spite of political consultants being present there in spite of narratives being run centrally or not or lack thereof of both people are winning and losing and more and more yeah. is happening because of the way the consultative process is being engaged by parties across candidates across the um country uh where they're talking to the public of what they want if you want good governance what does it mean for you and i think um unlike um the us or any other country uh, in this world 70% of our outreach programs are still very one to one okay you have to hmm. go on ground and people still rely on those traditional techniques and they know the candidates through and through they know the promises that can come and i mean the um, anecdotally the um, general public is very smart you know they they hmm. do not get as swept up in a wave as we might think or as okay. any post poll analysis would do so that is what i feel um, in my experience that is what i witnessed okay let's now open up in fact the floor for the questions that are pouring in on our different platforms on youtube facebook twitter and on the chat box here as well um we have a question for professor jading uh, somebody who's not we don't know the name uh, who's asking that she's running for office for the first time and wants to know what should be the key considerations how to make a difference against stalwarts who are already well placed with their robust election machinery professor jading well it's 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 tough i mean it depends on what what you're running for what party you're from all of that matters the institutional uh integrity of campaigns uh still is foundationally where are the votes how much money do you have to turn a vote all those things matter in campaigns whether you're in india uh, the united states anywhere and so part of it is and i tell potential candidates this a lot is that that you want a strong message you need to understand that that uh politics about those who would be served not those who serve so if you if you understand i need a message that resonates very normally messages resonate around fear and insecurities with an aspirational kind of umbrella that says i will address your fears and insecurities and i can give you hope but none of that will matter if you get drowned out uh by big money big message and you can't compete so all of that stuff matters and uh i i would i would encourage first of all i'm glad that this individual is running i'm glad they're uh participating but but you do have to have an eye toward uh kind of the structural components of campaigns in order for you to get off the ground in order for you to uh to to be able to have success i will also note it appears in many ways that that elections in india um there's at least an attempt to, in some circles to nationalize elections that can dramatically impact uh, uh, by race if i'm running for a local race or a race in a state what does that matter uh, if the if the message is nationalized all of those things come into play and and i will say this one of the, i've just been in india for a few weeks now but one of the interesting uh, observation when i talk to uh, individuals in parties that are not a bjp that so not in power the the overwhelming sentiment seems to be wow bjp has all the money bjp has all the technology bjp's controlling message and in in some of it is a, a little bit of throw our hands up what do we do and you know in politics you have to kind of play by the rules of the game if the rules in india now are you have to have money you have to play in social media you have to have structure you have to have voter contact then you have to do that um i tell people lot, you don't have to have dollar increment or whatever the currency implement that my opponent has but i have to have enough to win and and whatever that is you have to arrive at that number and then use that to take whatever message you've developed uh and target your voters my fear mm -hmm. is that that in in india from my observation mr modi and the bjp have done a terrific job of determining we're going to put a face on the election we're going to define ourselves before our opponents define us and we're going to define them before they get to define themselves in hmm. in any campaign that is a tremendous advantage 
And particularly when you have out parties that need to band together in order to beat uh, an incumbent party. I, the, the other point I would make is I get a lot of people saying, well, the election is 2024. It's a ways off. It's not a ways off. In today's world, we're in that election cycle. Mr. Modi is certainly in that election cycle. BJP is in that election cycle. And I, again, for emphasis, I tell candidates and parties, time is your friend until you make it your enemy. And right now, at least arguably, time is the friend of the out parties. But it won't be very long. It won't. It, it'll happen before 2024. Time can become their enemy. So if you're going to make a case, you need to start making it very, very quickly. Right. Uh, Somidip Ghosh has a question, Ashutosh. Uh, we are always discussing atrocities and financing of political parties. Is there no democracy left? Crowdfunding is not possible. Your thoughts on, you know, you did mention crowdfunding briefly. Does it really work in today's system? You know, there are news channels that are constantly asking for public funding and subscription-based money. Is crowdfunding an option moving forward? See, crowdfunding can be one option, but we have to understand that the politics is not about the battle battle for truth. Politics is all about battle for perceptions. So, Amadi Party could uh, could get that kind of money. Amadi Party could could contest election and win elections with such meager amount of money for a simple reason because they they created a perception that they are here not to do politics but to change politics, and that was a very exciting idea in that in that sense. And still, I think that uh, that idea is still working for them. But for a traditional political party, which do not have uh, uh, such, a, such a great image about, about them, uh, don't carry such a great perception, I think they all have to work on the perception. In 2014, if you look at, I think Manmohan Singh government did not do that badly. But the perception was so bad about him that the uh, whole Congress party collapsed and just, just uh, got uh, uh, reduced to 48 seats. And today, I don't think the Indian, Indian economy is doing that well. If you compare with the Manmohan Singh's government economy and the way the Indian economy was functioning at that point in time. But, the, but, uh, but uh, BJP succeed in terms of creating perception. And it is that perception which is a great stumbling block for the opposition to, to, to cross over. So I think crowdfunding can be one of the, one of the, uh, uh, can be one of the techniques to, uh, to arrange money. But uh, I don't know if it, it works really in, in that way. Because today, okay. if, if, like when I was contesting elections, when I was going to, from, from door to door, when I was doing door to door campaign, I met people who were asking money. They're asking money. Aap mujhe kitna paisa denga, how much money you can give me? And it's not about that some, uh, some uh, even the women were asking money. So I mm. first time I realized that it, it's such a reality. Those, those are the people mm. who are not worried about who's going to win, who's going to lose, or what is at stake for them. Whether democracy is at stake for them, authoritarianism is at stake for them. But, the, for, but what is at stake for them? What the, can you give me a thousand rupees or two thousand rupees or a bottle of whiskey or, or something like that? So uh, in that scenario, how much the crowdfunding can work, I, I'm still not very sure. Right. It's interesting you mentioned it takes me back to this uh, one a time when I was reporting in uh, Sri Parambadur in Tamil Nadu and I went to get a comment from this woman in a rural area and she had a small hut but the hut had a cycle, it had a mixer, it had a TV obviously given out by political parties and uh, she couldn't speak Hindi but she clearly asked me, she signaled to me that how much money are you going to pay me to be able to give a comment, you know, and this was at least 15 years back and things have changed a lot. Vasudha, uh, you know, let me take Kangshi Agarwal's question for you. She's actually asked a lot of questions, but in this one, she says, how do we make politics more accessible to young women, particularly women? What ensures the win, not just about the money factor, but where can they start working mm -hmm. on politics as a career? Okay, uh, so... See, the only way out is through, okay? That's one line that I stick by. So we need more and more women participating in uh, their first uh, election. So uh, there's, a, there's a saying on ground that you fight your first election to lose. I'm loosely translating it from Hindi. So, uh, you know, in spite of that, I think the only thing that is going to increase the strike rate is... Uh, the, when more and more uh, women stand for election, that's the first thing. And then uh, utilize uh, all of the, the mushrooming and the rise of political consultants in India, utilize this network of young individuals who are here and, uh, you know, take their help, take ideas, learn from the stalwarts, all of it. All of that combination, I think, is going to uh, help us. So the thing is, see, 
politics is just a reflection of the society right so we have how do we answer increase of women's participation in any industry and it's similar uh, in a political industry as well right so um, um pranka gandhi wadra had this uh, women's manifesto uh, she promised that in uh, uh, i'm going to give 30% 40% tickets to women in uh, uttar pradesh All right so 560 women uh, with 403 seats are there in uttar pradesh 560 women uh, had uh, applied uh, like had fought their first election not many of them won but they did fight it 34 of them won from bjp right so uh, the the first step i think is to uh, engage more in this industry not be scared not be afraid um there are various stages in which one could enter and um, political industry also offers like you can join a party as a spokesperson as well as the president of a morcha cell as well uh it you can be a direct electoral candidate as well it's all good right we need to mm. enter that space first or become a political consultant that is also one way uh, to enter this industry and then learn and work our way up the ladder so i feel ki um how would anyone answer for any other industry it's sort of similar Sort of okay, similar. Professor Jarring, would you right. like to come in on this? Especially given that in India, you know, unless the political parties don't really start giving out tickets to more women, and there too, it is very questionable. More often than not, it is perceived that at least the women who are getting the tickets either come from political families who have a certain political clout, uh, who are spouses of someone, who are relatives of someone. How do you go about changing that in a country as complex as India? And what attributes do candidates need who are serious about? a career in public life. Well, first of all, it's hard to change. I mean, you 15% of the, of the national parliament is women in India today and and obviously it's it's far too low and and until you start building numbers there, there's cachet in numbers yeah. or strength in numbers. But I think part of that has to be that 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 women have to be recruited into politics, women have to understand uh, that they can be successful in politics. But I also think there need to be entities. I don't know if they're NGOs, maybe it's part of a of each individual party. I perhaps it's a quota system, but something that says we're going to bring women in and we're going to give them a foundation to be successful. Uh there's still a, a tremendous amount of sexism in politics in India and around the world. Uh there are groups today that women can reach out to uh that will help them kind of wade through the waters of sexism and how do you overcome uh kind of the the higher standard that women candidates very normally just bluntly a uh, worldwide have to have to maneuver. Um the, the the point is it's much easier today because there are tools there but but you tend to need to have a a push the one thing that i learned a long long time ago in politics is that uh, the squeaky wheel uh, as they say gets the grease right if if women band together in india or anywhere and say we demand our voice be heard we're going to put forth candidates we demand that the party respect us but they have to have cachet they have to have women who say we are backing this up we will give you our support only if you support us that voice again so it's the majority population we know that worldwide if if you can bring that voice together in in a place like india i think you can move these numbers much uh, much more quickly but but it's very difficult for a woman today in india or anywhere just to say i'll put myself out there and somehow i'll i'll, I'll test the waters and less there's a foundation and less there's a group that is underneath that individual saying our voice uh it needs to be heard and if you reject our candidates our female candidates um you got a price to pay um when mm-hmm. india gets to that place i think then you're going to see a much more rapid a transformation where women have a much uh, uh easier chance to get into the system but it starts with someone taking the first step recruiting women candidates getting women candidates to say it's okay we will be there to support you but if that's all you do my sense is it'll fail you have to build a foundation under them and the one thing i know that political figures listen to other than perhaps money are bands of voters if the voice is loud enough politicians tend to listen ashutosh uh, you know having experienced the political process do you think that political campaigners can really make a difference in terms of honing up the skill sets of a candidate of making that candidate more acceptable more presentable unless you don't have real content and substance and ideas can uh, you know is it about packaging can the packaging help you know your your sense Uh, i think it's it's a tough one tough one to answer uh, uh, but i would like to to intervene what uh, about the women voters and the women candidates 
I think uh, in in UP the B, the, the Congress party. Did try to do something for the women. Forty percent uh, seats to be reserved for the women. But what happened? The Congress shrunk by three percent. So, the but defining... also because Congress didn't have anything to lose in UP, no. That's they why they took have, that risk. They should maybe. have retained at least about uh, uh, the, the social base. They lost by half, fifty percent. It's not that. They, it's not that they they, they have uh, they have gone out of the way to to, uh, to give tickets to the women. The defining line in politics, electoral politics in India, is the winability. Whether she or he yeah. can win or lose, if he or she can win, it, 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 it's not it's not important whether it is uh, with what is the candidate is Mamta Banerjee or some Suvendra Adhikari. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. The gender doesn't matter over there. The winability is the most important thing. See, uh, and uh, in my my opinion, I think uh, uh, politics in India is still uh, it's a very complex game. It's a very complicated game. And because uh, 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 the vote is not uh, uh, your vote is not decided on the basis of what the candidate is doing, especially in the parliamentary election and the assembly election. What the vote is decided by first of all to which political party you belong, and whether that political party has got a big picture to offer to uh, 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 to the voters or not. Today, uh, BJP is such a strong political party because they are in a position to offer something big. They they have made the voters realize that. Uh, they all of them are a companion into some some the reconstruction of this country. I think that appeals to to most of them. So, like for a small political party uh, party to create that kind of an aura to get into that system and to make voters believe that uh, is 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 almost next to impossible. So, like if hmm. you earlier earlier in the Congress party, I think the most of the almost eighty percent of the candidates. They did not win because they were good candidates. They could win because they they belonged to the to the Congress Party. Now after now at at, at present in 2014 or 2019, almost 70 80 percent of the BJP candidates who became the member of Parliament contesting election, not because they were very good candidates, not because they belonged to uh, uh, to, to 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 particular uh, 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 to particular uh, caste or something. Because they were contesting on the on the, on the BJP uh, on the BJP ticket, so the BJP was winning at that point of time. There was uh, some kind of wave for them, so they all won. So that's why I'm it's, saying Indian in Indian election, it's a very tricky affair. And uh, I about, think it's about, a, it's a very interesting paradox kind of a situation because on the one hand, while the campaigns are focusing on the individual attributes, on the other hand, you're also talking about the winability of candidates not stemming essentially from their individuality but from really the acceptance of the party ideology or the idea that they're representing. Uh, there are two kind of related questions. Professor Jarding, maybe you could take them. Saurabh sort of wants to know, what would a political consultant advise a client in regards to the electoral minority community on the opposite ideological spectrum in his or her constituency? Isn't the foundations of political consultancy and PR very economic and Freudic in nature, lacking human consideration? Ashish Tiwari wants to know, as the electoral politics moves towards the political consultancy and more organized campaign route and becoming more and more a number game, how to address the degradation of value-based politics in India? Well, let me start with the last one because I, I, I think it's critical. I, I actually would, would go in the opposite direction. I, I think the most successful campaigns in the world today are values-based campaigns. People connect to values. Doesn't mean you don't need the structure, you don't need the money, you don't need ideology. All that stuff matters. But what we have found in messaging is that, is that people tend to uh, look to aspirational values uh, as kind of a savior to their fears and insecurities. So the idea that I can impress upon voters that my party, my candidates will address those fears it, with an aspirational outcome, uh, normally value driven, I think is very critical. But I, but I, I, I would come back to I think this idea again of uh, it, can I make a difference? Can I? How do I? How do I win? Um, no matter where I'm running, it comes down to very fundamental. I need. I need a business plan for winning. I need the the uh, proper resources to win. I need to have strong voter uh, contact, voter persuasion, voter turnout. Um, messaging becomes a huge component. Yes, money becomes a component. In a lot of the races that I do around the world, uh, we we create literally shadow campaigns. Uh, obviously, they have to be legal, or we wouldn't do them. But in in countries that allow it, can we raise money? 
to help move our message, to help our candidates outside of party structure, because sometimes party structure, particularly in minority parties, may not give you the edge that, that you might need to win. So to, to me, it's a real bottom line business, right? I mean, if I don't win, I don't get title. If I don't get title, I don't get to govern. And if I can't govern, I cannot affect change. So politics is the vehicle to get you there. And so the, the first formula for me would be, we need to put together a, a campaign plan. Campaigns are a business after all, they are. You are selling a product, an ideology, a candidate, a party, whatever it is, but you're selling it. And how am I going to reach the audiences with a message that will make them want to buy what I'm selling? That all costs money. So budgeting and how you spend money and all the, the uh, pressures on where money is spent becomes very critical. Um, but but that's where I think India is headed. India is headed, and and, I, and I'm not saying they're not there. There's clearly a lot of really strong professionals in India that have done very strong things in political campaigns. But I think you're going to see that filter down to all levels of campaigns uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, and yes, that will mean to where you started tonight, all the money that you see in India, that's not going anywhere. It's just going to go up. But that's the nature of campaigns in representative democracies in the world today. And I think India is just on the, just on the cusp of breaking out into something that's considerably bigger, uh, and that includes much more expensive, but that's politics in the 21st century. And that will accommodate, you know, as the, as the audience mentioned about the opposite ideological positions, it will uh, kind of include that as well, you know, and well, it, will it, it be much more challenging for them to build that narrative up in the run-up to 2024. Well, it is, because the ideology, of course, is tricky, right? I mean, what's the party push and what are my national leaders pushing versus what I may want to do at a more local level? Um, I mean, again, I think it's telling that Mr. Modi, from what I can see and what has happened, is is trying to nationalize elections, trying to make elections more about big, uh, big national issues as opposed to local ones. For whatever his rationale, you're going to run into those pressures. And if I'm a smaller campaign and I don't want to run on a national issue, I've got a local issue that I think can carry the day, it becomes that much more difficult because my budgets at a local level are going to be much smaller as well. So that's the tricky nature of politics. I, I do think for India with multi-party system, I mean, if you look today and say, what's what are the major issues in India today? They're probably based more on national issues. Is it, as the out parties may want to say, it's inflation, it's gas prices, it's food prices. Is it, as Mr. Modi says, and the BJP, no, let's look to big picture, you know, many years down the road, let's look at who we are as a nation and, and what we want to look at. He's changing the dynamic, and the BJP is, I think, as to uh, defining this election, and at every level, whatever my ideology, that that is right now the turf I'm playing on, and if I don't want to be in that turf because I can't win, I better change that perspective sooner rather than later, whether it's ideologically driven or policy driven or values driven, however I craft that message, that's the challenge right now to me for the out parties in India if they hope to have any success against Mr. Modi and the BJP. Okay, I know we are already way past our scheduled, in fact, time for the conversation. I'll just take 10 more minutes and some last questions. Uh, we are flooded with questions right now. But so there are two questions for you. A freelancer political consultant wants to know how to handle a political campaign effectively in minimum budget. And Sangeeta Singh asks, you have been working with several political parties of different shares. What is the commonality you found with regard to the craft of election management? Uh, right. Uh, okay. So uh, for the first question first, minimum budget. Uh, see, the, the problem, like uh, why we say oh, this industry has so much money and as Professor Jarding correctly said, it's only going to increase is because your operational costs are so high, right? Uh, whenever I see these big headline numbers, it's, you know, like it's the petrols, it's the cars, it's the human resources, it's the rallies, it's, you know, I mean, the scale, one constituency in India is so huge, right? So for you to be able to make from one end to your other end, it's going to cost you a lot of money, uh, right? So the minimum budget is when you make certain campaigns and you make them both uh, physical and digital. I think that would be a very good way to go about uh, minimizing your budget. 
Uh, number one, think of all of the things. Um, if it's a rural constituency, there are still people who are on some kind of social media. They may not be all of them. Uh, that is one way in which you uh, figure out <clears throat> you run uh, social media campaigns. And so you minimize your costs there. And then you figure out certain significant areas in within the constituency where you can sort of um, uh, you know, amalgamate all the people. You can bring them all to one place. And because most of the costing that you have to do is operational, right? Like uh, it's it's as simple as that. So I, I feel, you know, you have to, as uh, more and more money is required, I think it pushes us to also be a lot more innovative uh, with what we can do. And uh, the use of functional technology like WhatsApp and everything that's available all across India. So that is, I think, use of such functional technologies is somewhere how you can minimize the budget. The commonality, uh, moving on to the second question, commonality between all of the uh, political parties that I've worked with is, uh, maybe it's my, uh, uh, I'm a little optimistic. I'm, uh, I believe in a lot of traditional politics. Uh, that MLAs uh, and MPs who are fighting to build a narrative around the work that they have done, they have actually done a lot of work. You know, it's many times we find ourselves helping candidates who, you know, just uh, they have an excellent CV. It's just no one has sat and made it for them. So that is one thing that I've found is uh, that uh, that is common among all of the people. There are people, there are candidates who are really trying to, hard to win and then serve the people. That's one thing. The second thing that I've found is the more developed a state is, um, uh, or the less developed a state in India is, uh, many of the concerns of the people when we do state level surveys, it's the same, right? Mm. It's uh, unemployability. Yeah, it's unemployability. Uh, it's also the MLA's performance, the incumbent's performance. What we feel may be counterintuitive when we go on ground, we see that, no, that is correct. People are looking at the candidate, their performance, etc. The third thing that I find is uh, the the okay. fervor of fighting elections is very very high across all parties right it's not right. just the bjp who's running it like that it's all parties that are running it like that maybe some are successful some aren't yeah i think from a jagan reddy to a kcr yeah. to of course in maharashtra the Thakres, everybody yeah. as long as you have the hunger you're there in politics uh this yeah. is the last set of questions dashutosh there is a question from malafesta how is narrative building leading to elections voting patterns do you, do you think the voting patterns are improving in India, also in terms of people who are coming out to vote, Ashutosh? And Ramesh wants to know what mechanism should be evolved to bring internal democracy in structures of political parties. I think the internal democracy in, the, in, in Indian political parties is almost dead. Let's not talk about it. And that's one reason <laughs> that the Indian democracy is getting so weak these days. Because every political party is led by some dynast. And uh, even if they are not led by dynasties, there is absolutely no inner party democracy. There's zero, zero inner party democracy. And, and every election, uh, which is because according to, to, to election commission, every political party has to uh, conduct some kind of election. This all happens on the paper. There's, there's, uh, there, there is absolutely no democracy. So I don't, I don't know how, how, uh, how what, what answer we can, we can find for, for this question. I think this, the, 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 what was the first question? I just, sorry. sorry the, vote, the voting patterns, how are narratives affecting yeah. that? Are they leading to more I voters coming is, in? There is, uh, I think there is, there is one model, I think which is very important model. And I think that also gives a lot of hope. The model was uh, by Ahmadi Party. Uh, and the Ahmadi Party uh, had given that hope for the simple reason, because uh, for anybody who's contesting election or any political party, a new political party who wants to create a, a space for, for themselves, uh, I think they should work on the big idea. The Ahmadi party's success initially lied in creating a big idea, which was radically different because they could uh, they could present themselves as a as a radical political party, uh, and they they present uh, they projected all the political parties who were discredited them them like like anything. Uh, it was it was attraction of this big idea which created so much fervor in, in in the in in in, in the Indian political system. And there were not not hundreds, but thousands of young volunteers who left their job, were working in, in some multinational companies, were working in some some uh, earning, earning lakhs of rupees. They all, many of them, they, they, they had given up their job, they joined the Ahmadi party and they worked tirelessly and without any, uh, any return. 
so i think uh, the if any political party which could create a big idea and around that they could uh, they, they could wave weave their campaign and they could they could sell that idea and they could personify uh, personify with that idea i think that is still works but i do not know what is the sustainability of such a big idea because amadi party over a period of time has really disappointed they have not worked to to scale up their, that that big idea uh, over a period of time in fact they have hmm. been appropriated by other political party is it the compulsion of the politics that's why they they have been appropriated or there was something wrong uh, within within them so i think but but still it gives lot of hope that if you have got a big idea and we can sell it successfully you can be a uh, uh, can we change and uh, you know professor jarring there is somebody who is asking is a political science degree or a masters in public policy necessary to enter the field of political campaigns consultancy if not how does one move ahead and make a space for themselves well i don't know it's absolutely necessary but any any educational foundation that can give you a perspective as to how a system works how uh you connect to voters or connect a message how um um you interact uh, with constituencies i think that's extremely helpful uh so i i'm a, a fan of those obviously i teach it katilia i taught at the kennedy school for 16 years a lot of students became empowered i think who went through those classes to say oh okay uh this isn't as hard as i thought or uh, maybe i was a little concerned about my communication skills or my campaign management or my writing skills or whatever it is or my policy uh, uh, perspective uh, now i have a stronger foundation on which to build so so one i think it's a great way to start i'm also a big fan of uh, uh you know getting on the ground and getting your feet wet right and and getting a little dirty in the trenches that um one of the best ways to learn is, is to go do it and one of the things that i've found in in politics is you can move up the ranks pretty quickly um that if you get into a campaign you get a little bit of experience because so many people don't stay in political campaigning they go into government or lobbying or whatever entity that if you say no i'm willing to go through a couple campaigns i'm going to learn i'm going to diversify i'm going to see how all the different departments work that you can actually move up the political consultancy chain pretty quickly because there is such a demand for people who have experience who know how to put these organizations together build a plan and so forth so i think it's a combination of of yes the educational background is very important and then just kind of boots in the ground absolutely and i think uh, you know it's just time uh, good enough for us to make a shameless plug that also do check out the course has been offered at cotilia school of public policy where the students are learning from the very best including professor jarring on campus on political campaigns too vasudha just a quick question from you briefly do you mm. think as a political campaigner you've been able to influence policy and make sure that your candidates included a certain policy matter in their manifestos or agendas absolutely 100% because of the advent of political consultancy all parties are now shifting to an extremely collaborative process on ground they are going to the people asking and they are asking for our help to formulate that and uh, the easiest way for a party to retain power is also to execute on the policy that they promised i it costs less lesser uh, right to retain the voters so i feel that uh, once you uh once you formulate that properly you find that both the public and the party is very willing to accept it put it in their manifesto and then dedicate a part of the budget in setting the government's agenda so uh, we found that uh, to be helpful yeah uh, ashutosh very briefly how much of the elections in 2024 will be fought on ground how much through technology data on social media i think uh, 2024 uh <laughs> Uh, it all depends on the opposition unity index and the kind of perception uh, it, it, it's a war of perception but basically and i think in in that game the bjp is way ahead than than other political parties if opposition could create a kind of perception they are in a position to defeat or they are in a position to successfully challenge mr modi then they have a have a game otherwise uh, uh, it's a lost game in that sense uh, so perception is very very important in politics and uh, uh is technology playing a key role in building that perception everything social everything, media everything 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 i think it, it it's a combination of many things uh, uh like like a great leader like like a big leader who uh, like mr modi or mr arvind kejriwal or rahul gandhi uh they themselves a message so uh, half of the half of the people half, half of the time people are voting for them or them only so indian election has become so presidential these days 
uh, that it's no longer longer a, a parliamentary system in that sense where the parliament used to uh, to assemble and used to elect uh, the prime minister now the people elect the prime minister and then the parliament uh, ha happens over there so i think the the perception management has the has been the biggest uh, uh, biggest thing in Indian electoral politics. If you could create a perception that you are doing something great, and whether you are doing great or not, that that's that's immaterial. With with with, with the disclaimer that I'm happy that you're back again in the newsroom. Is there a possibility in future you may like to hire a political <laughs> campaigner and get back into the game? I think I'm I'm a little skeptical. I'm sorry to say, Vasudha, but I'm a little skeptical <laughs> about this political campaigner for the simple reason because uh, politics is not about management. Politics is all about leadership. So the, the 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 consultant can only help you to to get the feedback to to strategize and re-strategize your things. But finally, the message is the leader. If the leader is strong, he could convey, he could communicate. I think Mr. Modi in 2014, everybody thought it's Prashant Kishore's game, but he won 2014, and after that, he won 2019. Arvind Kejriwal won. 2015 assembly elections with 67 seats and 2020 when he was uh, supported and advised by uh, Prashant Kisor, he, he got only 62 seats. In Punjab, there was nobody to consult, nobody to support them and they got 92 seats. So uh, consultant has has its role uh, to uh, to fine tune their, their strategy, to fine tune, to, to create a structure within the political party. But finally, it's a leadership. And without okay. leadership, you can have the best of the cons consultant it will not deliver. I see you very definitely not answered whether you will take the plunge or not with or without a consultant. <laughs> you will fight elections again in, in 2014. <laughs> in 2014, when I took a plunge in politics, even I did not know that the, the day will come when I leave journalism and join <laughs> politics. So when I was in politics, I thought I will never get back to journalism. And finally, I came back to journalism. <laughs> so the future is very uncertain. Nobody knows and nobody can predict. Never say never. I think there's a news headline there. But thank you, uh, Professor Steve Jarding. A final comment from you. You know, what has been the most challenging campaign that you worked on? Any candidate, you know, may you would like to declassify the state secret who was really <laughs> tough that you regretted having taken up the assignment with that particular candidate for a campaign? Uh, I don't think I'll I'll, I'll I'll choose not to divulge any state secrets <laughs> at this point. Uh, I've been in a lot of challenging campaigns around the world. Uh, some, uh, uh, as an American consultant, they don't want people to know that they hired an American consultant. So those would be state secrets. But no, I, I just, it, you know, campaigns are tough. Uh, they just are. It's a big business. Um, it does matter, though. People's lives are in the balance. So um, I, I look at campaigns. Uh, and very, and I know, you know, we talked tonight about the power of BJP and Mr. Modi and what they've done. I believe that all that is is accurate. Um, I also believe that everyone's defeatable in politics. I've, I, I, I think you have to in my business as a consultant, as a as a message person, as a communicator, you have to assume that. But I also believe it. Um, there is a narrative out there that says that India could go in a variety of different directions. It's incumbent on the challenges or the challengers to uh, Mr. Modi and BJP to make that case. Uh, Mr. Modi is making his case. I'm not judging right. whether one's right or wrong. I'm just saying uh, in India today, it is a very exciting time. The political uh, arena is wide open. Um, you're seeing kind of the modernization uh, unfold in front of your eyes. Uh, and that is exciting. It has to be managed properly. It has to be inclusive. Um, uh, and it could go in an opposite direction. It could be difficult. Money in politics can corrupt. But there's right. a moment and India's on the cusp. And I, uh, I'm glad to be a witness to it, be a part of it. And I wish it nothing but the best. There's so much on, on uh, at stake and on the line. Um, so, you know, uh, let's have at it. Let's let the best uh, uh, candidate and parties win. But let's put forth the uh, uh, messages and let's put forth an operation that's competitive and let's do what's best for India. Absolutely. And I think on that note, it's uh, time to wrap up this conversation. Clearly, it's a very different India, a different US. The post-Trump era by itself is a lesson for all political science students. But, uh, uh, you know, the campaigns aside, it is time. It is an interesting phase. We are going through lots of money, power, muscle power, all at stake. But more importantly, it's the messaging that matters. There are, of course, several regional leaders who in state elections have managed to stop that BJP juggernaut. 
there is, of course, no party that can truly be invincible forever. And as Professor Jading said, the time, of course, can always be your biggest enemy. But having said that, it is the most interesting, in fact, uh, uh, kind of chess field out there at the moment across the world when it comes to democracies, India being in particular a case study of great importance. Thank you so much, Professor Steve Jading, Vasudha Singh, Ashutosh for finding time to be a part of Let's Talk Policy. And thanks to all our students, to all the audience who streamed in through Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and sent in your questions as well. I'm, my apologies to those that we could not accommodate, but you can always reach out to them on Twitter and follow up with your questions. Thanks again. Thank you.